well, everybody calls me Dot, but my given name is Dorothy Pauline Judy's Robbins. When were you born? May 1st, 1934. Well, when I was little, it was right around the Depression, and we all lived with my grandmother in Port Arthur at 1112th Street. There was uh, my mother and daddy, and Dean and Hazel, me and Hazel, and uh, that we were the only ones at that time. And uh, the book was young; he was still in school. That was my mother's youngest brother, and her oldest brother, uh, Wilford, which we have called him Uncle Booger. He had the front bedroom, and uh, he's the one paid the house note. And uh, our family lived, had a bed in the dining room, and my grandmother had a bed in the back bedroom, and Aunt May and Uncle Lawrence, which was my mother's sister, younger sister, uh, had a bed on the back porch that was covered, and it had uh, an awning to, for if it was bad weather or cold or something, that would they close up when it was, uh, it was screened in porch. My dad used to that'd be a chicken fighter. They used to, him and his friends would fight chickens, and I used to help him train them. And he would teach me how to go teach them, push them back and forth on the walker to strengthen their legs and feed them certain things. and. And uh, we never had cats when we were growing up. We had horses and chickens mainly, and dogs. We always had a dog. And we had this one dog named Tubby, and we just loved him. He was a good dog. He was a real, real sweet dog, but he wouldn't let another dog in the yard. And uh, we had a horse that was named uh, Champion, and uh, that was uh, Jimmy's horse. And uh, they, they, Daddy sold, uh, raffled off a, a gun to buy it for him. And he bought him that horse when he was a baby, and they put it in the back seat of a car to bring it home. And uh, we had that horse for quite some time. And I was riding it one day, and a bee stung it. And uh, it, when the bee stung it, it took off running. And when it did, it was almost jumping the ditch with me to get to the street when, and Daddy jumped up and grabbed it and threw it down. And uh, it, it just, it, it, and he caught it just before he went in the street. And uh, so it, it, I got, he saved me from getting hurt, I guess. And uh, after that, I don't remember whatever happened to that horse. I think they ended up selling it or something. And then uh, we had a, a horse named Spot. And we've got pictures of him, everybody riding him. He was really a good horse. He would, all the kids in the, in, that were friends of ours would come over every day and ride that horse. And we put everybody, all the kids would stand on the back porch and get on the horse. And he, the horse would take them around the house. And he'd come back and he'd stop at the step. And if that kid didn't get off, he wouldn't move. The kid had to get off and another kid get on for him and he'd take him around the, around the house. <laughs> And uh, we had, uh, uh, we took, Dad took whenever his sister, Aunt Gertie, came to town. She used to live in West Virginia. And uh, she, when she came to town, one time we, were, we brought the horse over to Aunt Lorette's house. Aunt Lorette and Aunt Murtis, that's Dad's sisters, lived right next door to each other. And he brought the horse over there, and everybody rode that horse. And that poor horse, every all day long, he was riding people there because they'd take their pictures riding the horse, you know, and waving and everything. And Daddy had him doing all kind of tricks because Daddy had him trained. He would stand up on his hind legs and he'd uh, kind of paw, prance, and he'd do anything that he wanted him to do. He'd roll over, whatever you want, he wanted him to do, he'd do it. And that poor horse, at the end of the day, Daddy was riding him home, and he collapsed on the street. <laughs> he was so tired. So Daddy had to, ended up walking him home part of the way. 
and uh, we always had a lot of good friends coming over and a lot of family coming over. And when Mom and Daddy built the house on Rosedale, all of Mama's brothers were there. They were all there helping him build. And Uncle Dale painted the inside the house. He was a painter at Texaco. And uh, we, just, and we were every, uh, on for not every weekend, but a lot of the weekends, we would go to Barking Springs. It's a place in Jasper. I don't know if you've ever been there. It used to be beautiful. And it was at this great big log cabin that we would sleep on the floor. We'd put together up pine cones and put a blanket over the top of it and lay on it. And Daddy would put a rope around the pine cones, uh, not the pine cones, the pine needles. We'd put, uh, sleep on the pine needles and uh, just put a blanket over it to sleep. And uh, he'd put a rope around, the, around each one of them where we were sleeping so that snakes won't crawl over a rope. I never knew that. But he would do that so that snakes wouldn't go, wouldn't bother us. And uh, the, the cabin was, uh, had the wood floor, it was all trees that they had cut. Each piece was a big round piece of log that was laying on the floor. And uh, that's what made the whole floor. It was a huge building with a big, the only place that was closed in on it was the back where it was a big fireplace. And we'd go there all the time. And they had a big, you'd go up the hill on a path that was uh, all rock. You would step, you'd, the stepping stones would be the rocks. And you'd get up to the top of the hill and at the slanting down at the bottom of it was a lake. It's a beautiful place to be, and we go there all the time to swim. And they had, they had it uh, marked off for shallow areas and deeper areas for kids, and they had a place for them to a, a little place to sit. And they had a creek that was so ice cold we'd put watermelons in to get them warm, to get them cold. And we had we all we loved going there. We go there all the time. My dad used to teach us all kind of games to play. He taught us to play uh, uh, washers where you would bury a can in the ground and we'd try to dump, throw the washers into it, similar to what Mike and them play now. Uh, we played Red Rover and we used to, used to there was uh, fireflies everywhere. Every evening we'd go out and chase fireflies and try to catch them. Uh, you don't see them now anymore around here. Or ever seen them, and uh, well, all the neighborhood, the whole neighborhood was our playground. We'd play hide and seek, and we'd hide in every, everybody's yards, and uh, we had a good time. Yeah, all the neighbors were always friendly, and visiting everybody. Nobody locked their doors. Everybody just was, you know, everybody was friends. And uh, but you, I guess it wouldn't have done any good to lock doors because at that time. Nobody had air conditioning, and uh, so you had to open all your windows to be able to stand the heat, you know, so your windows were always open, so it didn't matter if you locked your doors. <laughs> so nobody locked the doors. One time, the, one of the neighbors got drunk, and he came to our house instead of his. He lived about three houses down. <laughs> and, uh, but all the kids played in our, at our house. And mother used to, mother made them coffee milk. And the neighbors would call up and want to know, well, how do you make coffee milk? Because their kids would go home and want coffee milk. So mama had to tell her what she did. We were mainly Cajun culture. My dad was Cajun, my mom was Cajun. My dad was Jiddies, my mother was Hebrew. And uh, so it's, uh, all the little Cajun customs of cooking and family. Uh, my, my grandmother was English, but my, but her husband was uh, was Cajun, and uh, he died when he was 33 years old. That was my mother's daddy. He had uh, he was uh, welding, and Gulf states accidentally sent thousands of votes through the lines 
and he was burnt because he had the welding thing wrapped around him. And uh, when it went through, it burned him to a crisp. There was hardly anything left of him. And they gave my grandmother, she had eight children, and they gave her $500 to settle for her settlement for the accident. So she ended up having to work, so they were all kind of on their own growing up. And uh, I remember one time they was talking about Pup, the youngest one. They would, used to have a baseball, uh, Port Arthur had a baseball league and he'd go peep through the holes at the fence to watch the game. And one of the guys told him, he said, won't you go inside and watch? And he says, me po, me no got no money. <laughs> so they let him in. So uh, they, I remember they still had a league when we were kids. They still had a baseball league. We used to go to uh, Seagulls, it was called, Port Arthur Seagulls. We used to go to the games for that. And I remember the first pizza parlor they had in Port Arthur. And uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. And they would play piano and, and sing and stuff. It was fun. It was a fun thing to do. I know it was crazy about pizza, but that was after I was grown that they had that. And uh, my favorite thing was I always loved malt, and I'd always get a malt all the time. Especially when I was pregnant, I had to have them all. So, and if Daddy wanted to go out to get a beer or something, he'd tell Mama, Dot wants some malt, I've got to go take her to get them all. <laughs> so I was his excuse. Anyhow, we all lived there all together, and my mother, my grandmother's grand, uh, father lived with us. And we would, our, our biggest thing that I remember is she had a, her, all the way around her house was trees of, uh, I, they were uh, mulberry trees, but they weren't the blooming kind. And they didn't have the mulberries on them. And uh, we would sit in the backyard and we'd climb the trees. I, I used to, I loved to climb the trees, but I could climb up in them then I'd be afraid to climb down because I was afraid of heights. So I'd get up there and then I'd cry for somebody to come get me down. But uh, we would all get together. We were always, my mother's family was together all the time. They were real close. There's, nobody did anything in that family without somebody being, somebody in the family helping them. It was always, they were always together, like my kids. And they, uh, we would all, the main thing I remember is my grandmother used to make homemade peach ice cream and she would cut up fresh peaches, and we'd, they'd make their own ice cream. And we'd sit on the on the ice cream maker while my uncles would churn it. And uh, we, we, they'd get, whenever it was done, they'd give us the paddles to, to lick the ice cream off the paddles. And we all played, all of us were always together. My aunt, Edith, had, had three children at the time. Uh, there was Jerry and Joe and, um, Johnny, uh, Jerry and Joe and, and uh, Dow Bass, but we called him Junior, Jerry, Joe, and Junior. And uh, they were always there. Tup and Dot built, that was my mother's brother, uh, they had built a, a house and garage on the back of my grandmother's property, and they lived there too. So we were always together, the whole family. And every time we'd do anything, they'd do it together. And when my dad uh, built the house, uh, we, well, we, when we bought, I, we moved from there. Uh, when Jimmy was a baby, and uh, we moved on 14th Street. But uh, when I, we lived with my grandmother, we was the Depression, and my dad, would have to to do to get work. He, he would take a bicycle or walk to the Gulf Refinery from 12th Street every morning because if you wasn't there, you didn't have a chance of getting a job. And they would pick men to work, so you'd have to, you'd have to go every day whether you got a job or not. 
and uh, sometime he get on. And he finally got on at the Gulf Refinery, and he worked there over, I think, close to 30 years. When he died, he was killed in a boating accident when he was when he was 43 years old. And uh, him and my mother were in the boat together. And at that time, Carlos and Judy were small. Carlos was four, and Judy was a baby. She was just eight months old. And I had them. I was keeping them while mother and dad went in the boat to go trolling. And uh, dad, uh, they were trolling and wasn't getting anything. So dad asked, uh, they, saw, they saw another boat further up, and they said, he said, let's go see if they're getting anything told my mother, and so he, they started out pretty fast in the boat, and uh, mother had uh, Ted's middle hat on to keep the sun off of her, and it blew off her head, and when it did, without thinking, he turned real quick to go back and get it before it sank, and it threw him out of the boat, because the boat went up on the side, and it threw him out, and my mother couldn't hardly swim. She swam, but not very good. My dad was a good swimmer, but they happened to land, and uh, they were three miles out. And it used to be, they, when they were young, there was a beach. Uh, Lake Sabine at the Pleasure Island it used to be a beach. And they would go out there and go swimming and everything, and they'd, they used to swim there. So he knew he could touch bottom, so he kept trying to touch bottom, but and he never could. So. Uh, he thought if he could find a sandbar or something, he'd give him something to stand on, but he never could find anything. But what had happened is uh, the week that they went to in the boat, they were dragging, had uh, been dredging for shell, uh, oyster shells and it had dynamited in that area and it made it real deep. And he, that's why he couldn't touch the bottom. And they, the fishermen saw the boat. The boat kept going round and around because it was in that turning cycle. And the fishermen saw it and they got to wonder why the boat kept going round and round. So they went over to check it out. And my mother's face was still barely out of the water because her dress was holding her up. But they couldn't find my dad. And uh, of course, and the, I, they called us and we went to moms and they had found her and brought her home and they found dad two or three days later. And, but uh, I guess that was the most traumatic time of my life and because uh, we all loved him a lot. And uh, I still think about him, still miss him. He's, he taught me a lot of things. When he was 43, he was very young and mother was really having a hard time at that time. I, I was married and I was, Ricky was a baby and I was expecting Mark when my dad died. And uh, we left Ricky with uh, Ted's mama and uh, she called us while we was at the funeral home because he was crying and she couldn't get him to stop crying. So we had to go get him. But we left him there because we was afraid he, my dad had so many flowers at his funeral, they were all double, two or three deep at the around the casket, and they covered the whole room of the funeral home. And we was afraid he'd be getting into the flowers and messing them up or something, but we went and got him. He was just a year old when Daddy died. And then uh, Mother had a hard time. She had Carlos and Judy when they were, and they were so little. Carlos was four, she turned five when we buried my daddy. And uh, it was, he died August 15th and we buried him August 21st on her birthday. And uh, because we were waiting for Dean to come in, Dean was in Japan at that time. Uh, Miles, her husband was stationed in, in Japan and it took a while to get, get her notified and for her to get papers to be able to come back home. And by the by the time she got here, we buried him the day before she got home because he, his body was starting to disintegrate and getting messed up. So we went on and buried him because we didn't know how long she'd be. And uh, so we buried him the day before. She, she, she didn't get to make it to the funeral. 
and then uh, with Carlos and Judy, mother had to go to work. Uh, I think daddy had $10,000 insurance and uh, that he had got from the Gulf Refinery. Or his retirement was $10,000, something like that. And they, uh, she got that, to, but that didn't go very far when you're raising two little girls. And so she had to go to work. So me and Hazel took turns taking care of Corliss and Judy. So they were like our own kids. And they were, Corliss is, was four years older than Ricky. And Judy was uh, a few months younger than Ricky, about nine months younger than Ricky, eight or nine months. And uh, he was born in March and she was born in December. So they were, they were raised practically like sisters and brothers, so they were real close. And uh, I remember um, when we were real little, uh, when they, during the Depression it was so hard that nobody had work and Daddy used to cut people's yards for a quarter to make money. And he would, uh, anything he could do to get some extra money to help. And there, everybody would give my grandmother the money and she'd pay the bills and what was left she'd divide with everybody. Which would really, when you think about it, really wasn't very good because Uncle Booger made the most money. So he gave the most money for everybody. He paid the house note and he gave his whole paycheck and he got his divided with everybody else's. <laughs> so he gave a lot for his family. He was, and they were always there. I, every, the whole time we was growing up, they were there. They were always together doing things. It was a lot of fun. And I remember the first time I ever drove. I was 12 years old, and I'd been babysitting for my cousins, Roxy and Janice and Larry, uh, because Aunt May and Uncle Otis, that's my brother's sister, and her brother Pup, who was the youngest, and his wife, he, and Uncle Booger, all of them had gone out dancing. And so I, we sat, baby, I was babysitting them, and he, they come home that night. Well, actually, the next morning, because it was uh, when they came home, he says, uh, Uncle Booger said, Do you know how to drive? And I said, Yeah. And I thought I did. I thought I knew how to drive because I used to sit on my daddy's lap and steer the car. Well, I thought I knew how to drive, so he gave me his car keys. He says, here, you can take the kids to church. So I left Aunt May's house, which was on 23rd Street in Port Arthur and was going to Rosedale Drive in Port, in Port Arthur, which is past uh, Ninth Avenue. And I started out driving with all those kids I had never driven before. And it's a shift car. And uh, they, that's all they had at that time. And so I just see my daddy's shift. So uh, I started out and people followed me to church, to the parking lot to ball me out. <laughs> that's how my, my driving was. And I got home after church with all the kids in the car. My mama liked to add a fit. She got the keys and let Don drive that car. He said, well, she said she knew how to drive. <laughs> she said, she don't know how to drive. <laughs> So that was the first time I ever drove. World War II. Uh, my mother's brothers, most of them went into the service. Uncle Booger's the only one didn't go into service, but he was uh, had uh, hearing problems, so they wouldn't take him. But the other ones, uh, Nuppy went into uh, the army. That was my mother's brother next to her, Took was younger, and he went into the Marines, and Pup was the baby, and he went into the Navy. And uh, then all of them survived it. Uh, Nup, the oldest of them, uh, was in the Army, and he drove an ammunition truck. And he, when he came back, uh, he, had, he, he changed a lot uh, from when, what, the way he was 
from before we went to the war. The, it didn't affect the other two that much, but it affected him really bad. Uh, but he was in an ammunition truck, and the Japanese were bombing, so they, him and his friend that was with him, jumped out of the truck. Well, he dove under the ammunition truck, and his friend ran for the trees, and they gunned him down. And uh, they b tried to bomb the ammunition truck, but they missed it, so he wasn't hurt. But he was captured and he was in that Bataan march that you hear so much about where they, if they, the men fell on the, during the march, they shot them. Uh, it was, uh, I guess it was a really bad situation. He was, you know, but uh, all, they all came home and they were all safe, so that was good. But uh, he drank a lot after he, got back home where he never drank before. But other than that, uh, I guess the Army, the World War II was a big difference in everybody's life. It was a lot of good times and I mean people were making money good, did a lot of good jobs. You know, everybody had a job because all the men were gone. The women were working and the men that were there had all the work they could stand. So. And they were getting paid pretty good. And uh, so it was a good time, in a way, for, the, for America, because was, everything was booming. And then when the war was over, it really boomed. And the guys came back, and everybody got their jobs back, and the country was doing, in good shape. You know, then the, after that, the worst thing was polio. Uh, there was a polio epidemic, and a lot of people died with polio. It was very contagious. Uh, it was a neighbor of ours that had it, but he survived it. And, but he has, he always walked with a limp after that. Most of them couldn't, it were, had to be in the iron lung where they couldn't breathe and they couldn't, they ended up being paralyzed and most of them died. It was a really bad, bad thing. But none of us ever got none of our family, so we were really lucky. Well, I always loved being a mother. That was my thought I was better at than anything else. Uh, of course, I had Carlos and Judy along with them, and uh, it was, I enjoyed the things we'd have. Uh, the kids would come over and the friends would come over and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed having all the friends over. The, the kids used to play games all the time. We had every game that ever came out. They had every game you imaginable. And the, they would play a game, they play Monopoly. And they make their own rules. And they, the kids in the neighborhood would all come over and play Monopoly. And, but they made their own rules where they could steal each other's stuff as long as they didn't get caught. And they could, uh, they could steal each other's money or steal each other's uh, cards for their property and stuff like that. So whenever they would leave for the day to, when they quit playing cards, they'd take all their stuff home with them because they didn't trust leaving it there with the kids. <laughs> the, the mom said, I remember that. David Britton was Mark's best friend. He lived in the next block about two houses down. And he was at the house every day. And uh, when the kids were growing up, uh, all, the, all their friends would come to the house. That Ricky and Mark were, teen, when they got to be teenagers, Ricky, Mark, and Judy. And they'd take Drew with them most of the time. They, every time they went anywhere, they went together. And they did everything together and they go, all their friends would come to the house. And they'd go to the beach and they'd come, one time they came to the house, but got back home around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock that night was making gumbo. They were all hungry, making gumbo for all the kids at 11 o'clock at night. And uh, they would come over, the, kid, their kid, the kids would, from other families would come over and they would, the Lanklesses, and they would, uh, one of the Lanklesses married Randy, Nita Lankless, 
married Randy. And Randy, uh, Ricky Lankless ran around with Ricky and Mark and them. And uh, they were always at the house together. And there, I would hide candy for Easter and stuff. And he would always find it and always get into it and eat the candy. And uh, they were, we would be, we'd be in the bed already and they'd come over and they'd come sit on the bed and talk to us. So we, I enjoyed all that. I, I enjoyed the kids. And we always had every, we had a vacant lot, so all the kids in the neighborhood played ball at our house. And we had kind of a tradition on holidays like Fourth of July and stuff, we'd all get together. All my family got together on holidays and we'd cook together and, and play games and things like that. And we used to play kickball all the time. So even I could play kickball. <laughs> Well, I wanted them to be good. I wanted them to to love God, appreciate all He'd given them, and I wanted wanted them to be likable and have friends. And I wanted I wanted them to grow up to be good, and I would, never had trouble with them. They were good kids. Uh, if they got into trouble, they didn't let, let me know it, everything. I remember uh, after they were all married, Ricky and, and I mean Mark and David were at, came over to the house and Mark was there, David came over to talk to see him. And they're sitting there saying all the terrible things they did. And I said, you did that? And there was one of my neighbors that one day she came to the house and the kids were out playing and she said something about the kids doing something. I said, well, Joanne, if the kids are doing something they're not supposed to do or you don't like, tell them to, to stop it and send them home. She said, well, I don't want to make them mad at me. And come to find out, they tortured her kid, and I didn't know that. They would take uh, Bradley, and they'd tie him up and pour water around him and tell him it was gasoline and that they was going to set him on fire and all kind of stuff. They had that poor kid panicked. They, they were meaner than I thought they were. So they, they did a lot of things I didn't know about till after they were grown and was out here laughing and talking about it. So I guess I wasn't as good a mom as I thought I was. <laughs> I thought they were all, all, you always think your kids are perfect until you find out later what they think that they do. One time they, I said, uh, they said something about sneaking out, out of the house. I said, why'd you sneak out of the house? He said, they said, well, it was easy sneaking out. It's just hard getting back in. <laughs> They'd sneak out the window and come back in the window. And I never knew, never knew it. So they took turns doing dishes. And uh, they took turns uh, cutting grass, the boys did. Well, when Cindy got in high school, she didn't want to do dishes and stuff anymore. She wanted to be able to just cut grass like the boys did. And not because the boys just had to do it once every so often. And because uh, they all took turns doing it. So they didn't have as much to do, but it was harder work. So I told her, I said, all right, if you can go and cut the yard by yourself and start the lawnmower and they don't have to help you, then you don't have to do dishes anymore. So she's out there trying to cut grass, and she was dating Mike at the time. So I was watching him out the window, and Mike was going up and down every row with her. He wanted to cut that grass so bad, and <laughs> she knew he couldn't, she couldn't let him do it. But they, they, they thought they was out of my sight, and Roy said one of them would take over and then start the line more for her, something to keep her from having to do dishes. <laughs> so they all helped her out. But they did dishes, their dogs were doing dishes, putting out the garbage and taking turns with the cutting the grass. And they all cleaned their own bathroom fixtures. They cleaned, they took, the boys took turn cleaning, turns cleaning theirs. And I could always tell him when it was Todd's turn because he, he had it spotless. Nothing was left undone when Todd cleaned it, it was spotless. But the rest of it was clean, but it wasn't clean as what Todd did.
Well, religion's always been a big part of my life. I was raised Catholic. I went to Catholic school. Uh, we were good friends with the priest. They would come to our house and visit. And uh, there was one priest named Father Fowler that I who really liked a whole lot. I don't remember where he was from. They used to come to the house. He was a little short man, and he was very, very nice. And uh, he he loved Hazel, and he would uh, sometimes he would take her out of class and just talk to her. And he she, he come up, he asked her one day. He said, "What did you want to be when you grow up?" And she says, "I don't know if I want to be a lady or a hula dancer." <laughs> Because our uncle had brought us back some hula skirts from Hawaii when they were in service, and she wanted to be a hula dancer because of that. She loved those grass skirts. And Hazel and I, growing up, used to uh, wear to wear the same clothes. One time, she had the skirt on something, and I had the top on something of the same outfit, and neither one of us wanted to give the other one the other part. And she ended up tearing my skirt, tearing my top of my skirt off of me, and then she got in trouble for tearing it up. <laughs> when I was growing up, I was always jealous of Dean because Dean was really popular, and she got to do things I didn't get to do because she was older, and it made me mad. So I was really jealous of her. And after we grew up, we were best friends. We were together all the time till she died, and uh, we did a lot together, and Hazel and, and Dean and I were always together with everything we did. And then Carlos and Judy, uh, Judy moved off pretty after she grew up, but Carlos was always there and she was like one of my kids. So we were always real close and she's been real, real ill. And, uh, I'm real worried about her. I've been praying a lot for her. I say a lot of prayers for her every day. I say my rosary every day. I was raised Catholic, and uh, when we were going, when we were in Catholic school, we went to church every morning. You go to church every morning, then you go to uh, school. When school is the First thing you do is say say your prayers at school. Then you would do the Pledge of Allegiance. Then you would do uh, your Bible study. You'd study, uh, they had the Bible written in language for children to understand. And all the stories were so interesting. And I would love to have had one of those Bible books like we had when we were kids. To even read now, it was so interesting the way it was written for kids to understand. And uh, at that time, I didn't place that much importance on it, but I would give anything to have them now. And uh, the priest, uh, there's been several priests in our lives that were real special. And one of them was Father uh, Patello. Uh, he married Corliss, and uh, he did the, my mother's funeral. And uh, he was our priest for a long time over here at St. Elizabeth, until he died a few, several years ago. Then uh, I went, started going to Neyland Church, and uh, Father Dan over there, it was a real sweet man, and he's still alive. And I see him all at church. Now he's retired, but he's living with uh, Father Shane at St. Elizabeth Church. So he does part of the Mass sometimes. And uh, he's a real, real nice man. And everybody loved him. He was uh, Mr. Needland at one time. They voted him Mr. Needland. He was such a sweet priest. Everybody loved him, and uh, he's still there. He doesn't get around very well. And then Father Shane went to school with Jean, and he used to come to my house to play with Jean sometime. And uh, he's the priest there now, and we all love him. He's so funny. He's uh, he 
he was in the Navy at one time, and after he got out of the Navy, he became a priest. And uh, so he's always telling stories about when he was in the Navy. And his dad was a mechanic uh, that taught mechanics at Port Natchez High School. So Todd was real close to his dad, so him and his dad, uh, Todd and his dad see, would visit a whole lot. Todd learned a lot from him. And any time Todd had trouble with the score, he'd go see him and get information from him. You know, just that I'm so glad to have my kids, my family, my sisters and my brother. And uh, Jimmy lived with me for several years after he got sick. And he never, never gave up or never felt sorry for himself. He just kept going, you know, he, you know, never lived life like if nothing was wrong with him. And he, uh, he was a strong person. And uh, I enjoyed him. We he get we get mad at each other once in a while, and he'd say, "Okay, I'll leave." And he'd get a, a t-shirt and a pair of underwear in his hand, like he's going to go out the door. And I say, "Oh, Jimmy, you know I don't want you to leave. Just go, home, just stay here." And he'd go put his back up. And <laughs> everything was fine. <laughs> and uh, my sisters were always there for me. They've always been there. Uh, they were there for the hardest part times of my life, and in the better better times, we've always done a lot of things and had good times together. And Hazel and I would go camping together and uh, vacationing together. We did a lot. Of, uh, our our kids were always together almost every day, and uh, we had a lot of good times. My family is very special to me. My kids are always there for me. I don't know what I'd do without them. Just that love, love, love your family. Be close to them. Enjoy them. There's nothing better than family. God made it that way so that we have each other. We, we need each other. This is what God made us that one. To love each other. Be there for each other whenever we need each other. Be there in good times and in bad times. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I don't I don't think so. Just uh People that don't have kids don't realize what they're missing. There's nothing better than having kids. Be there in good times and in bad times. Evil.